So once again, we are back in VS Code, my IDE of choice. I'm gonna go ahead and actually I'll leave the output up because we'll probably go back and forth with the output here. What I would like to do is go ahead and read through this from top to bottom in the high level C. And then once we have a good understanding of what this is doing, we will hop over to Ghidra and start reversing it. Now the intent of this practice is that we're gonna see the whole thing. It's, it's a clear box, crystal box, right? We're going to know exactly what the code, the high level code says. We're gonna walk through it step by step, line by line. And when we reverse it, we should be able to easily see the patterns that arise out of there. Now the challenge program I'll give you later, you will not have that advantage. You're not going to see the source code. You're only going to get the compiled executable. And it will be your job to find the flag and reverse that using a disassembler or debugger or whatever tools of choice and submit that for wall of fame status. But for now, let's focus on walking through our practice program and hopefully putting into practice a lot of the concepts we just went over in the first half of this video. So starting from the top, we already discussed the include statements and how we need those in order to reference certain functions. As we come across those functions, I'll try to reference back and show you which headers those belong to. And then we talked about this being a macro, define, basically just substitutes anywhere this uh, alias is used with the integer 10. So let's walk through the rest of this file and see exactly what's going on. I will tell you that the intent of this practice program was to fit as many C style uh, programming principles and structures especially into a uh, small program so that we could see how each of those programming structures translates over to assembly. For example, we can start with global variables. Global meaning that this is just an integer that's floating out here, it's outside of any function. For the lifetime of our program, we will be able to see this global variable from any of our functions and reference it accordingly, and we've just set it to 13. The next couple lines might look a little strange if you haven't worked with C before. We are, number one, defining a struct. A struct is simply a container that has other, uh, or it has a variety of data types in it. So whereas if we had uh, just a list of integers, we would use just an integer array, a struct allows us to have differing types of data like characters or integers or integer pointers. We'll talk about pointers in depth in just a little bit. But just keep in mind that structs are kind of like the primitive precursor to classes in C++ and other object-oriented programming. They're just collections of other data types. Now, the thing that might look strange is typically you could de define a struct just like this. You don't need the type def and then the capital uh, copy of this variable name right there. The reason I'm using this is this is a common way to uh, shorthand type struct thing. So if I didn't do the type def and I didn't put the capital thing here, every time I wanted to make a new struct of that type, I would have to say struct thing t and then initialize it. So instead, I, by using that type def, I can now say thing t and it's the equivalent. In case you were wondering what that's all about. Same thing here with node. We'll use that a little bit later. We'll come back to it, but that's just a struct with an integer and then a pointer to another node in it. Wonder what that could be for. We already talked through the, uh, well, actually let's do this. Let's actually start in main at this point because main is gonna reference all these other functions. And again, I didn't uh, you know, follow conventional practices with writing this. Typically you wouldn't have all your code in one file messy like this. But for the sake of practicing, I think it's a bit easier to process. So going down to our main function, which is going to be the first one that is run, we're going to call print function header, and just like we saw in the debugger, we're gonna pass in the main string, just like that. All this does is print to the screen, just like we saw up here, the function name and the stars and says running. So that's just letting us know where we're at in the program when we're running it. Let's go back down here. After we print that function header, the next thing we're going to do is set up some local variables. So we have one name x, they're all integers by the way, right here. Uh, we have one name x, which is gonna be set to five. Y will be set to seven, result will be set to zero. Okay, those are all set up. 
just some local integers. We also have a local integer array. This is the syntax for specifying an array. And notice that we're using our array size macro here, and that's gonna be translated to 10. So we're saying we want an array of integers that's size 10. And what we're going to do is fill that array using a for loop. So for an integer i, a counter set to zero at the start, while i is less than the array size of 10, increment i, and then set the element at array position i to i plus one. What does that mean? It basically means that if we start at zero for i, array zero, the zeroth element of the array, will be set to i plus one or one. So we're basically just putting the numbers one through 10 into that array. Then we have a character array, which is basically a string. And that just says, I'm a string, look at me, and then the new line character. We're going to specify a string size. So this right here is a little bit of a shorthand for initializing string size to the size of the string. What we're doing is we're setting it initially to zero. Then we're going to walk through that string character by character until we hit the null byte, which is signified by this backslash zero here. As we do that, we're gonna increment string size every time. So basically we're saying, just measure the size of the string. It's a hacky way to get the size of the string by just counting the characters one by one. Next, we're going to print quick math's result is, this is a placeholder for an integer, and then we're going to place in that placeholder the return value from this function quick maths, to which we are passing in x and y, which are five and seven respectively. So let's bounce back up. Also, I need to find out, there's a quick way that you can, there's a keyboard shortcut that I need to look up real quick that you can bounce back and forth here. One second. Ah, F12 is what I was looking for. F12 will bounce you back and forth between uh, where a function is used and where it is defined, which is very handy in our practice file here. So quick maths takes in two parameters like we just saw. Uh, I did name them the same things. This is not good practice, but I named them the same things that they were passed in as, which is X and Y, just to make it simple. Oops, didn't mean to do that. And we're going to go ahead and print the function header, which is, we see that right here. And we set up a local variable called A, an integer, and we just set it to three. And then an integer pointer called B. And I guess there's no better time to talk about C pointers just as a little detour for those who may not be familiar. This is a topic that scares many computer science students and um, I'm not trying to be elitist here, but I never understood the fear behind pointers. I know it's if you're, if you're not used to memory managed languages, it can be a little daunting, but they're really not a hard concept once you get used to them. So a pointer literally just points to a value, it's an address. So I love this website, I'll include this in the resource as well, Geeks for Geeks, they have wonderful explanations of a lot of topics, including pointers. So let's use the uh, example of an integer pointer. So let's say we have a variable called var. We set it to 10. So var lives at an address in RAM, right? And we, we saw that when we walked through how our, our program is loaded into RAM. If we make a pointer, which is this little asterisk will indicate an integer pointer or any type pointer, we can initialize it to the address of var, which in C, you write the ampersand and then the variable name, and that'll get you the address. So pointer, if we reference just pointer on its own, it's literally this address, which we'll say 2008 right here. So again, var itself is an integer that is the value 10, that is stored in the address in RAM that we're calling 2008, Pointer is set to the address, which is 2008. So if you print the value of pointer itself, it'll just be 2008. But the magic of pointers is that when you use the asterisk on a pointer, you do what's called a dereference. Come on, you guys. There it is right there in front of you the whole time. You're dereferencing a null pointer. Open your eyes. And when you dereference it, you're now adjusting the value at that address. So when we say asterisk pointer equals 20, we are actually setting the value at this address to 20. So if I printed var at that point after this, var would be 20. See how this is, I know it can be confusing, but 
Don't you worry your little head. It's not, it's, it's not that scary, I promise. Another thing they demonstrate is you can have pointers to other pointers. And this is where it gets kind of crazy. So I hate that they use the same variable name here, but I also did the same thing in the practice, so I can't complain that much. But basically, let's imagine we make another pointer, but this time we say it's a pointer to an integer pointer, so double asterisk. We can set that new pointer variable to the address of this pointer. Now keep in mind, let's, let's backtrack here. PTR currently has the value 2008 in it. However, the address of PTR right here is not 2008. It's another address wherever PTR, the pointer variable itself, was allocated. So separate address, and they don't note it down on here, so I'm just making sure you have that straight. This is not 2008. This is some other address in memory. So now we have a pointer to that, whatever that address is that this variable lives at. When we take this variable and we dereference it once, we are dereferencing pointer's address. So we're getting the value at PTR, which is 2008 itself an address. When we do a double dereference, we then dereference 2008 and we're back at var's location. So when we say double dereference PTR equals 30, we are once again changing this value and we can print var and it will be 30. This page has a couple of other examples and you can actually see they actually demonstrated this by making a variable called var, setting it to 20, made a pointer, printed it, and then you can see the value of PTR itself is an address where var lives. The value at that address is 20, and the value at the dereference pointer, which is the same address, is also 20. I think if you scroll down here, they also demonstrate the changing of that address and the whole pointer to a pointer thing. Yes, right here. No, maybe a little further down. Okay, again, do a raise. Anyway, it doesn't much matter. I think you get the point. No pun intended, but I do enjoy it. Uh, you can go to this page and read all about pointers and also know that you can use a pointer to reference an array. And you'll see us doing this in the practice program. What I mean by that is sometimes you'll see array reference kind of like with the brackets. That we're, that's what we're used to is we declare an array of three integers and here are the three integers that are in that array. We make a pointer to the address of that array and then we can actually iterate through that array by taking that pointer address and incrementing it. Now the special thing with pointers is when you increment a pointer, it's not like you just add one to it. This is specifically an integer pointer. An integer in C is typically four bytes. So what's actually going to happen is you'll see this address starts at the start of the array, which is gonna to point to 10. That address starts at this one ending in 50. When we increment pointer, it's not gonna increment by one mathematically, it's not going to in increment by one. It's going to increment by one times the size of whatever it's pointing to. So one times four in this case, which means that the next value is going to be at five, four, and the value after that is going to be at five, eight. And they have a nice illustration there. All right. I think I've touched on this detour enough. You get the idea. The link will be in the description. Let's get back to our practice program. When we call memory allocate or malloc as it's lovingly referred to we're saying hey whatever the size of an integer is i would like that amount of memory so that i can um, have this pointer to that address and later i might put something in that address now with dynamic allocation we need to be careful because whatever memory we allocate we need to clean up after ourselves when our pro when our function or program is done otherwise when we allocate that memory our program is just going to hang on to it uh, it might get damaged. We might get hanging pointers out there. It's no good. So important to know that for every malloc call we have, we will have an equivalent down here, uh, free call right here. And I've just spotted, or no, that's good. Okay. I thought I spotted a bug here, but what this next line is saying is if malloc returns uh, zero, which is not B, just basically means not any non-zero value, then 
we just print, uh-oh, no memory left, and we return zero. Now, assuming that malloc is successful and we did not run out of memory, we're going to receive an address back. And we need to cast that, which is what this parentheses int pointer is doing. We need to cast that to an int pointer type so that C knows that that memory should be treated as an integer pointer. And it's going to be assigned to our B variable. And we're going to dereference B and set that to 5. So again, to recap, we allocated some memory on the heap exactly the size of one integer. And then we put a value at that address. That's all we did right there. We then have one last local variable called m, which is simply the character m. And then we go through printing off a list of different uh, operations. Now the point of this is not so much to read it in the high level C, um, but you can see it in the output here. And we're gonna dig into these more when we go to the assembly. For now, just know that we're basically just doing some basic arithmetic, filling in this format string with x plus y equals the sum of x plus y, on and on doing several different types of mathematical operations, which you see down here. So keep in mind for main, we passed in x and y of five and seven. And so up here, when we refer to x and y, all of our operations are working with those numbers, at least for this block right here. And you can see the output makes a lot of sense. Five plus seven is 12, five minus seven is negative two, five times seven is 35, five divided by seven is zero because we're not, keep in mind, we're not taking the remainder five modulo seven is taking the remainder of that division, which is five, and then we get to shifts. So let's go down to shifts here. In C, we can do a left shift just by doing this symbol right here, double caret to the left. So we're saying, hey, take A, which was three, shift it twice to the, right, to the left, excuse me. Let's take our calculator here so you can see what that looks like. So decimal three looks like this in binary. When we shift that two times, these two bits, these two one bits are gonna be moved over. So let's do that, shift two. And we can see that they're shifted over here. That's decimal 12. All right, do the same thing with right shift. We can shift, uh, let's see, what are we doing? Shifting th 13 to the right by one, we'll get six. And by the way, you can also shift characters. And again, this is mostly when we get to the assembly to see how this is treated, but characters and integers are treated very similarly in C. So you can see that M shifted to the left by three equals H. How does that work, you may say? Well, for every ASCII character, which I didn't, I wasn't prepared for a, uh, a um, ASCII table, but I can look one up easily right quick. There we go. So now we have a full ASCII table here we are working with lowercase m, which in decimal in ASCII is code point 109. So let's go to our calculator here. There are 255 characters in ASCII from zero to 255, so 256 I should say, 256 characters, but the greatest value is 255 because those characters have to fit within a byte, and once you hit all ones, you can't go anywhere else, so 255 is the maximum uh, character code you can have. So we take M, whose value is 109, and we shift it to the left by three, we get 872 because that character is being treated just like an integer would. The difference is that when we try to then print that value using printf, it's gotta print the ASCII value, but since there's only 256 characters in ASCII, we're going to modulo it by 256, and that gives us 104, which you guessed it, is the character of H. I was very confused there because I wasn't looking at which column I was at. That's 104 octal for D and then 104 decimal for H. So that's how that math is working out to give us the shifted characters. So it was a little bit of a detour, but I thought that was uh, important to uh, touch on. And you'll see when we get to assembly how that whole character versus integer relationship plays out. Below here, we're doing some bitwise operations. So I'm just doing a uh, five and two, five and two bitwise is zero, five or two. Uh, again, this part is not as exciting when you're looking at just the output or the high level C code. It's going to be when we get down to the assembly level that we really see the stark differences between these different operations like anding, oring, working with pointers versus working with integers. That's the point of the high level languages. It obfuscates a lot of those things from us. 
So let's move on. Let's see, we do a couple of, uh, the last things we do is uh, we'll look at Boolean values in a way. They're not really true and false, but rather zero and one. So in this case, we're saying, hey, compare A plus two, see if that's equivalent to the value at B, and then print the result of this comparison. And C, if you do a comparison like this, it's gonna return a zero for false or a one for true. At this current time, it looks like when we print this line, A is three, three plus two equivalent to five is true, and so we get one back as a result. Same thing down here, three equivalent to five, that's a false, so that's zero. Three less than or equal to five is one. Again, kind of boring if you're looking at it from this thousand foot view at high level C code, but once we get to assembly, it'll be a little bit more interesting. Lastly, we're going to, again, for every malloc, we have to have a free. We're gonna free the space we allocated up here to get B, and then best practice says we should set that pointer to null so we don't just have a dangling pointer uh, pointing out to something there. And then we're gonna return a value, which is Y minus X. And if you remember back down in main, we simply print that value right here. Print quick mass, result is two. Makes perfect sense. Moving on, let's see some other programming constructs in loop soup, which as you might've guessed, will be all about programming loops like while loops or for loops. We start off the same way, we print our function header loop soup, set up a local variable, you guys are used to this at this point, and then we're just going to run a few uh, different loops here and output the the, uh, the results of those operations. So while x is less than three, print x and then increment x. So we see zero, one, and two, or sorry, we started at one, so we just see one and two. Now one tricky thing to follow here is that we initialize x to one here. We then reset it right here in the for loop to zero. But in between this for loop and the do while loop, we do not reset it. So when it's done with this for loop, it's gonna have a value of 11 because as soon as it hits 11, it's no longer less than or equal to 10. And so this loop will break out. And we can see that right here. In this in between purgatory where x is 11, some, something funky happens because right here, we use a prefix increment operator, which means that before we print, we're gonna increment x, whereas if we wrote x plus plus, we would be printing and then incrementing x. So subtle difference, but important difference. And the reason I bring it up is unlike a while loop, a do while loop will run through this statement once at least, and then do the evaluation right here. And so we see x was 11 right here. Since we increment it with a prefix right here, it's gonna be 12, then 13, then 14, and then finally, it's gonna print one more time at 15, and then we evaluate one more time, it's no longer less than 14, and we break out of that loop. Next, we're gonna start an infinite loop, and you'll notice I switched over to using an actual uh, Boolean in here. That's defined in the standard bool header right there. And I just did that to show what that looks like in assembly, which we'll see in just a little bit, but spoiler alert, it just equates to a macro that is the number one. So nothing's really special going on with booleans in C. So we start an infinite loop and we start incrementing X, keeping in mind that X is at 15 when we start. And as long as X is not equivalent to 17, we will continue, which basically just means continue through the loop, move to the next increment. Otherwise, if X is equal to 17, it'll say X is 17 now, time to break, and then break out of this infinite loop. And we see that reflected right here. X is 15 when we start. We increment it once, it's not 17. So we, or we print once, it's still not 17, so we go through again. We print one more time, and now it will be 17 by the time we get to here, and we break. That's what's going on there. Again, nothing too complicated, very simple programming concepts, hopefully. Um, and then once we get to the assembly is when things will start getting a little bit more interesting. For now, let's head back down to main. Next is terms and conditions, which you may have guessed has to do with conditionals, if statements, basically. So as usual, we're gonna print the function headers. 
I'm going to use booleans here to do just to keep it a little easier to track and set A to true and B to false. Down here, we will see that we're saying A is true. This is a ternary operator if you haven't seen this syntax before. And what this means is that when deciding this value right here, it's saying, hey, if this is true, then do this first thing. This colon says else do this other thing. So basically translated to this situation, we're saying, hey, if A, which basically equates to if A is true, go ahead and print true, otherwise print false. And since A is true, we'll see it's printing true. All right, so now we set A equal to B, and then we say, oh, actually A is, and then we use the same ternary operator, and now it's printing false. We reset A, print again, we do some uh, comparisons here. Note that whereas bitwise operations were one ampersand, this is now two ampersands, which equates to logical and, as in these two things are true. And the double pipe is logical or, which is either A is true or B is true. And you can see how those equate down here. Again, nothing too crazy. Actually, yes, something too crazy. I forgot to put this in here. This is a problem in C, not so much in Rust. I think they fixed this, or fixed it, quote unquote. They flipped this behavior in Rust, so it's uh, a little bit more um, intuitive. But in C, you gotta be careful with some of these logical statements or bitwise statements because something like this, so C and D, so four bitwise and six, which is, just to prove it, four, is not equal to zero. So this should evaluate to true, and yet we see that it evaluates to false. Why is that? It's because C orders precedence of this equivalency statement first. So since D is not equal to zero, six not equal to zero, this evaluates to one, and now we're doing bitwise and of four and one, and that evaluates to false, because yes, bitwise and four and one is indeed false. So when you add parentheses to be, make yourself more uh, understood, that works out because now everything in parentheses gets done in the right order. Just something to be aware of. And then we just have a simple uh, non-equivalency and a switch statement, which if you're not familiar with this structure, a switch statement basically takes like a nested if else um, conditional and turns it into several what are called cases. So instead of saying if x equal to one, do this, if x equal to two, do this. We basically say switch on x, and then depending on the value of x, that will determine which case runs. So since x is two, it doesn't match case one because x is not equal to one, so we're gonna skip that. It does evaluate to two, so we're gonna run x multiplied by two. This little operator, if you're not aware, is multiply itself by two. So x is doubled, and then we break. If you do not have that break statement in the end of a case, it just falls through. So let's say x was four, it would run, or uh, sorry, if x was five, it would simply go to the default case and fall through because there's nothing under case five and we shouldn't ever get there. So we get the print statement, never should have come here. And then we're done with terms and conditions. Moving on to disarray. In disarray, we are going to go ahead and, uh, actually, let's go back to main real quick. I guess I missed, we're passing in the array we set to the numbers uh, one through 10 earlier, as well as the size of that array, which was 10, uh, obviously. We go back up to disarray. We're just gonna do some basic array operations. We're gonna start our own local array of the same size, and then we, we also populate that one with one through 10. We see that reflected right down here. And then we loop through and we compare the local array to the past in array. And of course their values are gonna be exactly the same because we initialized them exactly the same way. Then we do something a little bit more interesting here. We're basically doing the equivalent of this, oops, this, just like we did above. But the difference is we're gonna use malloc to dynamically request some space on the heap to have a dynamic array. So we're gonna say array size, which is 10, times the size of an integer, because again, in malloc, we're requesting a number of bytes. And since integers are four bytes, we actually need 40 bytes, which is why that multiplication is important. 
But the end result is exactly like this, except with a dynamic array, we have the option of doing something like this where we can reallocate that dynamic array to be twice its own size at runtime. And of course we do the same checks to say, hey, if the reallocation fails, no memory left to make sure we free up that pointer that we had before, set it to null, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, all right, I think you can see that right here. We can see it has starts with the size of 10, gets dynamically reallocated to a size of 20, sunrise, sunset, moving on. The next function is going to be just a pointers, and of course that's going to be dealing with pointers of some sort. And since we're passing in string right here and string size, we can imagine we're going to be working with character pointers, which are essentially what strings are. So let's go up to using my handy F12 shortcut, disappointers, and sure enough, we pass in a character pointer and an integer called string size, which is the size of that array. The first thing we do is create a local variable, which is just a copy of this pointer right here. The reason we do that is what we're going to do is increment that copy of that pointer and print each character that is in the passed in uh, pointer. So basically what we're doing is taking that string, we're treating it as an array of characters, but using a character pointer, and we're iterating through each of those characters and printing them. The reason we set up a local copy that points to the same address as string is because as if we just used str and incremented it, we would not be able to get back to the original value of str uh, easily. Uh, we'd have iterated through it and the pointer would now be pointing to a the end of the uh, array, if that makes sense. So instead we take a copy, a, a different pointer, set it to the same address, and then iterate through that instead. We then set that copied pointer to null, and then we treat str just like an array, and you can see that that results in changing up the characters. All right, next will be structure stuff. The astute of you will have noticed that this was actually not here earlier. I just realized as I was recording this that I forgot to actually call the function, so I fixed that. The magic of editing, we won't miss a thing. Speaking of thing, you'll remember that we defined a structure called thing up here. We gave it a character called C, an integer called X, and then an integer pointer called PX. If we go back to structure stuff right down here, we create a new thing, again, because we did the type def, we're able to use that syntax. We set the character C, which using structures, use the period to access members of the structure. Thing.C will be equal to the character X, capital X. Thing.X will be equivalent to 13. And then PX is just gonna be a pointer to thing.X. Again, this is not as exciting at this level, but when we get to assembly, we'll see some cool stuff going on with those pointers here. Then we just create another thing, thing two. Do the same thing, just set it to some different uh, items here. Although I just noticed I had a typo here. Um, or maybe I did this on purpose. I've already forgotten. Uh, this should probably be thing two dot x, I believe. And so when we do thing two dot x uh, seven and then thing two, oh no, that was probably on purpose. So purposely did it to the other things uh, X and confuse myself in the process. The reason I did it that way is to show you that I can set this pointer in my other structure to this guy right here, who's in thing thing one, we'll call it. And when I print thing two dot X, you can see it is indeed seven. That's that rings true. But since I changed thing one dot X to twelve here, when I print the dereference pointer of thing two it will actually be 12 because it's pointing at this memory right here. So it's just a quick demonstration of pointers and how they factor in destructs as well. All right, now we get to the last, certainly not least, probably most complex portion, which is linked list, not to be confused with Zelda list. If you've taken any computer science course at all, you've probably heard of the linked list. Another one that's the bane of computer science students everywhere, but it's really not that complex once you know what it's about. Linked list is basically just a cool way of doing uh, dynamic arrays in a way. So in this case, we have a node structure here. A node just has an integer called data, 
and then a pointer to another node structure called next. So what's the whole, you know, what's the, the big deal with being able to do that? Well, what we can do is build kind of a, a snake here or a linked list as it's called. And traditionally what you'll do is you'll make a node struct called head, which will start at null. And then I have a little helper function here that's just going to be used to insert a node into a linked list. What that looks like is, for example, I'm going to pass in a pointer to head, which is currently just null. And then I say, hey, in my linked list, pass in a node with a value 99. We go up to this function, passing in the node pointer and the data. We're going to make a new node by, again, dynamically allocating it. Make sure that returns a valid address. And then we're going to set that new node's data to whatever we passed in. And we're going to set its next to head. What's the big deal there? Well, let's see what this looks like in a graphical form. If we go down here, we continue to add to the linked list. We add 66 and then we add 33. As we do that, we're going to go through, or I should say after we do that, we're going to go through and then print off our linked list from head to tail, as it's called. So we have a pointer. We point it to the current value of head after all these insertion operations are done. And then while that pointer is not null, we're going to print the value of that node and then move to the next node by using this arrow, which is equivalent to doing something like uh, star current dot next. So we're accessing the current node and then accessing its next value. The arrow is just shorthand to avoid that other syntax. So Let's review what this actually means in practice. So we started by inserting 99, or I should say we started with a null uh, pointer. We then inserted a node with the value 99, and we pointed the next, uh, the next uh, attribute of that node to the null pointer. So there's nothing after that. We inserted another one with 66, and we pointed it to the new head, which was this node that contained 99. And then we did the same thing with 33, and we pointed that to the old head, which was 66. And so you can see we basically inserted, almost like a stack, we inserted from right to left uh, all of these things into our list. We have the head of the list here. We go from 33, we traverse to the next pointer. We go to the next node, which holds 66. We go to the next, it holds 99. And then we hit null, and we stop printing things. And that's the end of our linked list. So I'm not going to get into the, you know, all the various wonderful uses of linked lists that they talk about when you go through school uh, and courses and, and et cetera. But suffice to say, for now, we're just showing how the structure can be traversed. And then we're going to do uh, another traversal through it, except this time we're going to delete them and free the memory we allocated for each of them as we go through. So we go through, we start at the current, which is our head. That's the one that contains 33. We use a temporary uh, local variable to delete, to hold a pointer to that structure. Then we set current to whatever's next, which is going to be this guy 66. And then we delete the node that's in to delete, and we set that to null. And so we're basically just making sure we clean up after ourselves, deleting all of the structures that we allocated with malloc up here. And that, my friends, is the end of our high level C walkthrough. Hopefully there's nothing too complex here. Even if you're new to C, some of these items like pointers, structures, might be a little uh, unnerving if this is your first time breaching into C or C++. But hopefully at a high level, all this has made sense. If not, take another pause because we're at the last part of the video. Next, we're gonna walk through the assembly of the C program, and that'll be it except for your challenge program. Before we do that, take a break, digest everything we've just talked about, maybe take a day, come back to this chapter, and we'll start from here in the next section.